Um, my name is uh, Agnes uh, Kovac, and I have the great honor to introduce uh, our uh, first plenary speaker, Susan Carey. I'm um, in a very easy situation because she's one of the persons who does not actually need an introduction for this audience because uh, we all know her work, we all base our research in, on, on her work, and uh, actually I think there is no single person in this room who was not influenced by her research and uh, the ideas she had put forward, independently whether we work on uh, language development, conceptual development, social cognition, numerical cognition, object cognition, and I cannot almost think of any field of cognitive development in which she had not have done um, influential research. So um, I would like just to um, add uh, a couple of uh, personal notes. So I have um, great personal admiration for her, for, and I would like for many reasons, but I would like to highlight two. And one is because, uh, um, because the way of, um, of how she thinks and how she manages to ask always the deepest question possible in any field or any domain which relates to cognitive development. Um, the second is her absolute uh, dedication to, to research, and I would like to just uh, give two case studies. So one is uh, she is currently, since a couple of years, doing wonderful work in coordinating a huge collaborative uh, project which relates to the, to the topic of her talk today, which is about uh, um, early logical inferences uh, in infants and, uh, and children. And this involves lots of administration, lots of fighting, lots of coordination. It results in wonderful uh, workshops and conferences and wonderful outcomes, but it's a lot of work which I'm sure she's not so happy to do, but she nevertheless does it. And it's, um, it's really great for us and uh, it brings wonderful ideas. And second, um, what I wanted to mention is uh, um, that uh, um, this dedication to research is also evidenced by how, how she supports the crazy ideas of students or uh, young researchers and how she manages to transform these ideas in, in really deep questions and uh, wonderful uh, studies come out of this. And um, also this support extends not only in supporting ideas but to hosting various students, postdocs and visitors in her own house. So please uh, welcome with me Susan Kerry. This is an extremely um, sweet job for me today to be here speaking at the CEU and this cognitive development unit because um, it's the, the research that has come out from here, the ideas and the training of students and, uh, and collaborators um, in this group is sort of unparalleled. And so um, it's a great honor to be asked to be one of the main speakers. Um, and it's so sad what's happened to this university and this country. Uh, okay. So I think I'm going to argue today that it's a time to take, that the time is here to maybe take on an age old problem that we haven't really, that's really I think not the center of studies in cognitive development and maybe could be or should be. Um, but it's very, very early days in this research program. So I'm going to explore how we might do this work. Um, and um, spoiler alert, uh, I'm going to make the strongest argument I can make, but tomorrow I can make the opposite one, right? I mean, we, we are really, you know, I, it's just boring not to make an argument, so I'm going to make one. But, um, <laughs> um, okay, so what is the question? Um, the ontogenetic origin of abstract combinatorial thought. This is the kind of thought that articulates language, explicit logical interest, inference, explicit model building. Um, where does that capacity come from? And we know um, that there are uh, innate evolutionarily ancient 
um, conceptual primitives that are abstract and powerful and get learning off the ground, um, sensory, motor, and perceptual representations, but also core cognition. Um, and core, co core, cogn core cognition is conceptual. It's cognition in the sense that there's a rich, abstract, conceptual role. But otherwise, these systems of representation are very perceptual-like. Um, they're supported by innate input analyzers, perceptual input analyzers. If there weren't those perceptual input analyzers, they wouldn't do you any good because you couldn't identify things that were in the domain for which you have innate conceptual roles. Um, um, and I, I think the format is likely um, iconic for those representations, but that's an empirical question. But the existence of all of this kind of innate support that gets um, cognition off the ground is not inconsistent with there also being other kinds of represent, innate representations that might be available that are, I think, underexplored in the uh, literature. Um, and uh, for example, um, does pre-linguistic and non-linguistic thought, at least in some animals, have the properties of a Fodorian language of thought, a logic-like, language-like language of thought? So what are those properties? Well, there's a, a logic-like format, arbitrary unitary symbols, not iconic or analog format, um, combinatorial productivity, um, uh, propositional content. That is, these representations bear truth values, not just satisfaction conditions like perceptual states. Um, support deductive inference. Um, the question is, do non-linguistic creatures, non-human animals, and infants before they've mastered natural language, the natural language lexicon and syntax, have a Fodorian language of thought? Um, now, I just want to make a, a very clear statement about what this question isn't. If you adopt a representational computational theory of mind, which I think is the only game of t in town, as Fodor would say, um, in modern cognitive science, then it's very unlikely that the machinery of mental computation does not include AND gates, exclusive and exclusive OR gates, negation functions of various sorts, set representations, functions on set, et cetera. That's not the question. The question is whether the symbols for these logical functions are available to animal and infant thought, productively combining with any symbol available for thought. Okay, so what, now what we need is well, what are we talking about for thought? Um, and here's just a first pass. These enter into person level um, reasoning. They're articulatable and working memory models that are the input to determining choices and actions, sort of the input, the, the end state of all the parallel processing that's actually guiding action. Um, um, <clears throat> um, and they can. Uh, articulate and formulate rules um, in terms of concepts in any domain the creature represents. Um, um, they compose freely with others, um, uh, with other explicitly represent, represented symbols. Uh, like, not in the bucket, not the same, doesn't want the ball, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So the question is, is there a Fodorian language of thought? Um, and Fodor argues, obviously, yes, it, in non-linguistic creatures. And his argument is, what else allows for concept, central conceptual role, right? The inputs from all different perceptual systems have different formats, et cetera, yet we're able to combine that information in a action. Complex animals can do that as well. Um, and the argument for pre-linguistic infants is even a simpler one-liner on his point. This first one was a book line length argument, this is a one-liner. How could language be learned if there weren't non-linguistic representations with the same properties su to support the meanings of words and um, morphological and syntactic and semantic um, rules? Um, other philosophers have argued, obviously, no. Um, Donald Davidson and Descartes, for example. Um, and um, I think there's there's no doubt that there has to be innate support for this kind of thought. Um, but there's two, I think, versions of the possibility of the existence of innate support for abstract combinatorial thought. 
that are, that are sustainable while you still deny um, that nonverbal creatures have a Fodorian language of thought. Um, and one is that it arises in hominid evolution with language and in ontogenesis only upon learning language. That is, the innate support is part of the language acquisition machine. Um, or it's present in non-linguistic creatures, but it's implicit. Um, there's, not a, there's not explicit symbols with that content. It's carried by the computation that explicit symbols enter into. Okay. Um, so how do you even begin to study a question of this sort? Um, you have to choose case studies, um, and you're going to have to do it case study by case study. So um, the, the McDonald network that Aggie mentioned, we have case studies of recursion, set representations, logical connectives, um, um, abstract relations like same and different. Um, a, a variety of case studies are ongoing in, in this network. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, a, some work that a lot of us are working on and for which we have different initial inter, you know, guesses about how it's going to come out, which is what makes it very productive. Um, and this is um, the representation, the, the existence of logical operators, propositional logical operators like or not, modal operators like possibility um, that articulate non-linguistic thought. Do animals have concepts like not, or, and possibly? Um, um, now, there's both an empirical and theoretical question here, um, which is how do we characterize what we're looking for? Um, and then how on earth would we find out uh, whether a non-linguistic creature had representations of, of the sort we're looking for? But why these, this is a good case study to look at the origin of abstract combinatorial thought, I hope, is obvious, right? These, these don't have any meaning other than their role in inferential combination. They're just inherently combinatorial. And they operate on propositional um, representations to um, change truth value. So if they're genuinely log logical operators, they pre presuppose uh, propositional uh, representations um, and they com they're 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 abstract because they combine with any proposition that you can represent. Okay, so so how would we find out whether um, babies or non-human animals um, have uh, concepts that have the content of these logical operators? Um, Well, one way um, that's been adopted both in the animal literature and in the developmental literature is to look for evidence that animals can work. For, let's take not an or to start with, the disjunctive syllogism. Um, so why this would be a relevant case study, the disjunctive syllogism is can you reason from a, if A or B, not A, therefore B, right? So if you, can, if you can show that animals are working through a disjunctive syllogism, then you've got evidence um, for logical thought in animals. Okay? And um, indeed, um, there are tasks that have been used with animals that have been interpreted at least by some people who did those tasks as showing just that. Um, so for example, beginning with Premax version of um, calls later Cup's task, and the, the Gergay and Watson adapted this strategy when they took on this, this question, comparing dogs and five-year-old children, um, through to the Niccolo Sassana Alati's um, et, et al., along et al., beautiful science paper, people have adapted, adopted just this strategy. So I want to give you an example of a task, show you that non-linguistic animals and very young babies um, solve this task, and then ask, why aren't we finished? Um, so let's, uh, the answer is we're not. Um, okay, so here's, here is a, a version of this task that, this is the version of the call cup task that we've used with infants, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show you data from this task. Um, but it's a very simple task. Um, you just bait, one, you have one object or one piece of food, you, bait one of two cups or one of two buckets in this case out of view of the participant. 
you then show the participants that one of the cups, you show, reveal the cups again, you show one is empty, and the question is, do they know to look in the other one? Very simple task. Here's how it works with, uh, this is a 15 month yeah, old. Stand up. Yeah, hold on. Oh, are you ready? Hey, look where it's going. Okay, and then look at this. And look at this. All right, where's the ball? Can you find the ball? Oh, where's the ball? Okay, this is somebody who failed. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but, um, Call and the 40 or some replications and extension to other animals have shown many, 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 almost every species tested. Um, um, there are some animals who spontaneously uh, pass this task and give them several trials and virtually all do. So it's within the capacity, solving this task is within the capacity of non-human animals. And I'll show you the developmental data la later. Um, the other task I'm going to talk about today um, is this beautiful ex science experiment that I mentioned by Sasana Alavi et al. And so just look at the inference condition here. Here's the task. You show the child um, a snake and a ball. Notice that the top of those are the same. You cover them up. A cup comes in and scoops out one, and you can see the top of, the, of it there. And at that point, the baby is supposed to be thinking, is that the ball or the snake, right? It could be either. Then um, a snake comes out from behind the screen. At that point, the child can, can think, well, it's, it's, not, it, it, it's not the snake, it's gotta be the ball in the cup. So you've got A or B, not A, therefore B in the cup. And then after, after the child has gone back, there's one or two impossible out, or possible outcomes. You can either reveal what's in the, in the cup, and it can either be what's, what they inferred or vice versa, or you can have the wrong thing come out from behind the screen. Um, you get the same results both places. Um, and the finding is that babies, that 12-month-olds and 19-month-olds look longer at um, the unexpected, impossible, deductively impossible outcome in either case. Okay. Um, so we have non-linguistic animals um, passing a task with the structure of a disjunctive syllogism, and we have 12-month-old um, uh, infants. Now, who counts as prelinguistic? By what criterion? For non-linguistic, there's no problem. Animals are non-linguistic, um, but prelinguistic. Children don't learn the the words for logical connectors in their logical meanings. Um, until not, probably until, uh, by, in English this is, um, work from Austin et al. on Tomasello's lab and, and Roman Feynman and, and me in our lab converged on not until a few months after age three um, are children using not to, uh, um, in, to invert the truth function of a, of a sentence. Um, and or, and I'm gonna show you modal operators come in at, in language even later. So if you, by prelinguistic, you mean you don't have the words for those logical connectives, anything before that is prelinguistic. But there's a re another relevant sense of prelinguistic. When do children learn the language of argument, substantial argument structure? Um, so, because th that's evidence for the language of propositional representations. Maybe you need to know that before you can, um, certainly you need to know that before you can learn the, the language of which words are uh, truth functional operators, but maybe before you even have the concepts that will combine with those. And the answer to that is that there's very good evidence that a lot of that argument structure, at least in English, is in place by 15 months of age and not before. Um, so, so the 12 month olds in, in Arladi et al are prelinguistic in both respects, right? So, so, so why aren't we finished? We have um, animals doing a disjunctive syllogism and we have prelinguistic babies doing a disjunctive syllogism. Okay, here's why we're not finished. In the animal literature, 
and also in the Sasana and Arlotti um, uh, paper. The, 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 it, it's often written in terms of success at the disjunctive syllogism. But there are hedges. Um, so um, Call, uh, in, in a review paper by Volter and Call, um, Call said that these, that these non-linguistic representations are proto-logical. And Arlotti and all ask, could these be precursors to logical operations? OK, so neither group tells me what a proto-logical or a precursor is. What you need to tell me is, why is it proto-logical or not or possibly? That is, how, why does it have the, the content that, that that makes it a proto-logical version of those particular connectors, and what's different between a proto-logical one and a logical one. Um, now, I think we can actually say that, and what, I, what I'm, I'm going to offer you the way that I'm thinking about it right now, um, but really what this is a call to um, is for us all to work on what that could possibly mean. Because here's why it's important. If it's proto-logical, it's probably still going to be an example of abstract combinatorial thought. But it not, but might not be the full logical operators. I mean, that's what it would mean to be proto-logical. What, what could that possibly mean? Um, and if, there, if we can say what it means, and if we can show that that's what babies or young children have, then we have the beginning of a learning story, right? Um, so, so this is important, right? Um, um, and um, so what would proto-logical not, I'm going to first do just proto-logical not, and then I'm going to turn to or and possibly, which are related to each other. Um, in both of these experiments, the logical function is exclusion, and that's a genuine function of negation. If the exclusion is based on a composed not in this bucket or not a snake, um, then this is logical negation, right? Um, but it could also be based on, based on contraries. So bucket is, the bucket is empty, is a contrary to, to the ball is in this bucket. Um, but co and contraries do a lot of genuine work of logical negation, right? I mean, they're talked about in the context of negation, but not all of the work, right? So what you can't do with uh, contraries is compose them with other logical concepts like if not A or B, then C, right? Um, and it also... It, they, they tell you that this thing is the negation of this thing, but they don't determine a complement of a set, which is what not a ball does, right? Um, so, um, so what I'm saying is that, that uh, 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 let me just give you another, another, uh, wait, that, no, sorry, I just, okay. Um, Another sense of protological knot is simply mismatch. Um, so suppose you create a template of a goal. And then if you condition the exclusion of objects, location, states on encountered mismatches to that goal, that's a kind of negation, but it doesn't involve a representation. So suppose you're looking for the ball. OK, so you have a representation of a ball. Um, you can notice that, you've, that where you just searched, contained an object that's a mismatch up to a ball or no ball whatsoever um, without representing not a ball. So if you, can, if you can condition a response on a mismatch, that's also protological negation. Uh, could be, OK? Um, and there are also ways that you could talk about these tasks which aren't even protological not. So sticking with the search example, create a template of a goal. Now, just suppose that the way that you try to achieve that goal is a random, you just move around seeking a match, right? Um, and you just keep doing that till you find a match. That can be a way a worm finds something to eat um, that's genuinely goal-directed that doesn't involve any negation at all. If the only, if the only computation is match, not, there's no mismatch in there, then it's not even protological negation, okay? Um, okay, 
And Susanna Erlati also suggested that there, a, a possible way that the animals could, the, the, t the babies could be doing their object identification task um, is with representations that don't even include a precursor to not, object file representations. Um, and one reason I love this study, and this is the one I'm going through, is they actually did a serious, serious attempt um, to uh, rule out an object file account of this. Okay? Um, and so if all they had was the experiment as I mentioned it and the impossible and the possible, possible outcome, you don't need any negation for that at all. And here's why. Um, so you have a ball and a snake at the beginning. And all that stuff happens in the middle. And at the end, um, you have, uh, if you've seen the snake come out from behind the, just look at the very end. You've seen the snake come out from behind there. And now you reveal that um, the thing in the cup um, is the ball is another snake. Sorry, that's the inconsistent one. That's inconsistent with your initial model of what you saw, right? So you never, you could never, you, you might never make a prediction here, and you could still notice that the inconsistency. Um, similarly, if you've seen the snake come out, and now there's two objects, so you know there's another one there, then the ball comes out again. You've got a model where there's a snake and a ball and something else. There's three things, and that's inconsistent with your initial model. So if that's how you're doing it, um, that is using the machinery that's very well attested in the literature on object individuation and object file representations that doesn't involve any disjunction, any negation at all. So this is why they had the no inference condition. I mean, this is a classic problem in, in the study of literature, uh, the literature on violation of expectancy. The question is whether the babies are making predictions that are being violated or they're waiting till they see the outcome and then making a retrodiction. And for most reasons that we use this methodology, it doesn't matter, because we're just interested in the content of, uh, of those, either the pre prediction or the retrodiction, it doesn't matter. But for this case, it desperately matters. And they showed you're making an inference. Um, and the way they did it was they had a no inference condition um, which starts out the same thing. You see the snake in the ball, but you see the cup come in and you know which is in the ball, that the, the ball is in the cup, and then you cover the thing. So you know fully at three there that there's a ball in the cup and the, that's just part of your initial model because you've seen it all, okay? But now it unfolds like before. The snake comes out, goes back, um, um, and, um, then you, you go through to the consistent or inconsistent outcome. Now, because since you know exactly what it is, of course, you're also surprised at the inconsistent outcome in these cases, too. Okay, so what they analyze is what happens in that potential deduction phase. Um, it, they, there's no inference anybody has to make in the, in the no inference condition. So they measure cognitive effort with, with pupillometry and, and looks to the ball as evidence that, that the cognitive effort that you see actually um, reflects the inference you're making. And what they find by comparing those eye tracking measures in the potential deduction phase is that the kids are making the inference in the potential deduction phase. They're not waiting to the end, okay? That is gorgeous. Um, um, and it certainly rules out the simple version of the object file model where it's only retrodiction, where you've seen the full model at the beginning and you have the full model at the end. Okay, so why it's important to rule that one out, because if that's the right interpretation, then this experiment doesn't bear on either protological or logical reasoning, right? So it's still a beautiful experiment for showing a kind of inference, but there's perceptual inference as well, right? Okay, so how would we <coughs> proceed to try to decide, are these representations full-blown disjunctive syllogism? Do they involve protological representations? Or are they not even? My spell checker cha kept changing protological to proctological. <laughs> I, um, I, I found that, um, that many times. Okay, 
I told you what a what a proctological what a, what a not even proctological representation <laughs> of the search tasks would be. That's just having a goal and match computation at all. Um, but what about this one? Haven't they already answered that? Well, I think not. Um, um, but I'm not. By the way, the fact that I'm showing that there could be an alternative doesn't mean that that alternative is right. Right? That all three of these options are still open. I'm just trying to say we have to distinguish the options before we can even try to explore which one is right. Um, so another way of thinking about the object file representation is that what the child is, this is what's happening in retrojection. Um, the child sets up an initial model of what's in this, in this a snake and a ball, and put the screen. That's still consistent with what, they, what they've seen. They can represent this great uh, snake and the ball between it. And then they're just watching what's unfolding, monitoring consistency with that model that they're, that they're maintaining and updating as anything happens. So when the thing sneaks in, it snakes, when the cup scoops in and gets it, there's a, now there's an object there and there, there's an object behind. That's still consistent. And they may not wonder, is it the snake or the ball? Or is it the snake or the ball in the cup? Is it the snake or the ball behind the screen? Um, um, but, but so far, they've never seen, they haven't seen anything that's inconsistent with the initial model they've had. Then when the snake comes out, that disambiguates um, that, it's, that it's the snake behind the ball. And the inference now is just a one-to-one -one mapping. They have a model of a snake and a ball. This is the snake. The other has to be the ball. You don't have to say it's not. This one has to be the ball because it's not the snake. There's just two. You know which one is. Now you know the other one. So a simple one-to-one -one mapping, there's an inference there. And, and it might take cognitive effort to, when you see it in the, in the, in the cup, um, to see why it's still consistent. One of them must have moved, right? But it's not evidence, it's not clear that the, the evidence for inference that you're getting in that is the, is the inference that involves either a disjunction or a negation. So I call this consistency moder monitoring model specification one-to-one one, one -one mapping inference. Okay, so how do we, the 12-month-olds are the real interesting ones here because they're prelinguistic in, in both respects. Um, so can we find other evidence for logical negation in 12-month-olds? Well, there are three or four efforts I know about, and they all fail to find it. So this is reason to doubt, reason to favor um, the non-linguist, the non-logical interpretations of success of the 12-month-olds in our Lottie uh, experiment. And um, we don't know what the age of success in the call cup task is for, for children, but I'm going to show you. Um, so one is there, has been a, th there have been attempts to um, see whether babies can form a representation with the content, not a ball. Okay? And this is an experiment that Roman and um, Fiery Cushman and I did together. And it... it um, depended upon um, the Woodward reach paradigm. So in one condition, I on every trial, it's a different pair. Ball and a cup, ball and a, I don't know, whatever that is, a wallet, ball and a stick, right? It's different. It, it's A and B, A and C, A and D, and, and in one case, the hand always reaches for A. In the other case, these are, between subjects, the hand always reaches for not A. Can the child learn the rule? Um, he's reaching for not A. He doesn't want A. Um, and the answer is seven-month-olds and 14-month-olds easily learned that he's reaching for A in, in preference to B, C, D, E, F, and G. And they utterly fail to learn the rule. He's reaching for not A. When after he's reach for not a, after they've dishabituated because they're bored with the whole experiment, you then show them um, an, a new pair, A and Z, and he reaches for the first time for A, they don't care at all, right? Um, so that's an attempt to s see that they can create, compose, 
um, not with A and, and specify the complement of that set, and they failed. And there's also a, a failure um, in, uh, by Jacques Mailer and colleagues um, where he had three syllable words like so to, you know, more than three syllables, sotuma vefi. Okay, so, so there was sotuma vefi predicted one thing, and any other multisyllable word that was not sotuma vefi predicted the, the other direction. And they learned the rule, sumatavedi picked one, and they were just random for all the rest of them. So they, 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 could, they don't naturally compose the representations that are underlying a goal with not, okay? at 12 months of age, okay? Um, well, what about protological representations? Can animals condition a response on a mismatch, okay? Um, well, there's some literature that suggests they can, match, to mis match and mismatch to sample. So animals can learn match to sample in like 12 trials, okay? So here's an experiment with bees, one of my favorite of this. The bees go into a little wine maze, they see a, a red square, um, and they go up and there's a, there's a red square and a, and a green square there, and match to sample, they're supposed to seek, go to the one that matches. So if match, choose that arm, that's the rule. Um, takes 12 trials to learn that, with red and green. So the, they might be learning the rule, choose same, they might be learning the rule, if red, choose red, if green, choose green. But they're learning the latter because it generalizes with no further training to new color pairs, to, to, pair, to pairs of gore, Gabor patches with different orientations, no further training, and to orders. You know, you've got a patch that smells like licorice, you've got, then you've got licorice and banana, and they again generalize, um, choose same, okay? 12 trials, really easy. And Jean-Rémy Hochman and I um, showed that it takes babies 12 trials to learn this as well. Um, so here's the experiment that we did. Um, sorry for the, oh, let me just, a loud, annoying noise. Okay, so. <laughs> Amazingly, kids liked that. Um, so, so what you see is it start, they start out blank, two side things come down, a middle one comes down, and then the one that matches and match to sample. Oh, by the way, the bees learn not match to sample in 12 trials as well, right? So, so you can learn, that, that was, that's of course essential to the argument. They learn match to sample, but they learn non-match to sample. There, it's, you know, if, if choose the one that doesn't match. So that, that's at least protological negation, it seems to be, okay? So um, these kids, kids learn, then the test trials are simply, do they anticipate which one is gonna go around before it starts going around? If they, if they do, they've learned the rule. And they learn match to sample and mismatch to sample, again, in, in 12 to 20 trials. trials. Both, they learn both rules. But the question is, what rule have they actually learned? Um, they could have learned, um, they could be solving them both on a rela the relation match. If the rule they learn is seek a match in match to sample and avoid a match in, in, in non-match to sample. So which rule did they learn? And here's an experiment that answers that question. Okay, so this version is just another, it's a conceptual represent, replication of this. In match to sample, you have three cards and you're turning them over like this instead of going down below. Um, so first you turn over the two side table ones, then you do the sample, the middle one. And then what happens when a much more pleasant sound occurs is that the one that matches in match to sample expands and, and contracts. And the reason you want that is you, you'll see in a minute. Um, um, so it's conceptually the same thing. They again learn it in 12 trials. And Don matched a sample, the same thing. You turn them over one at a time, you show one in the middle, and the one that goes up and down is uh, in and out is the one that doesn't match. 
And the way you now tell which rule they learned is you only give them part of the information. After they've learned that, now what happens is you only reveal one of the side cards. So it can be the, the visible one can be the one that's the same or the one that doesn't match. So in the visible, so every kid gets both type, types of test trials. And the question is, oh my god, OK, the question, is, I'm only going to be able to finish negation here. Too bad. Um, the question is, um, um, have the, which, the input to which rule leads, the, leads the, to the proper success. So if they've learned and matched a sample, choose the match, then the visible same test trial should be easier than the visible different test trials. And in, in the not same, the mismatch case, if they learn the rule, choose the mismatch, that should reverse, right? So non matched sample, it should be reversed. So what actually happens? Okay, here's the first fixation's um, match to sample. Um, um, look just at the dark bars, that's the, the match to sample results. Indeed, the, the, the babies succeed on the visible same test trials, and they fail on the visible different one, as if they, they're actually computing the rule, find the match. But now, concentrate on the non match to sample. It's the same pattern. They succeed when the input is the matching trial, not the mismatching trial. So they were not following the rule, thought, you know, condition your response on the mismatch. They're, they're, fo they're following a rule, conditioning the response on a match, and then that's a different condition, right? Okay, so let's skip this. So we, we, we decided that we would try to find another reflection of success on the on an exclusion um, trials um, at 14 months or less, you know, it, um, to find some other evidence that kids are using it are likely to be using either logical negation or protological negation in your task. And the one we decided to do was the call cup task. That's the, the, the procedure I just showed you. Now, why did we choose this one? Well, first of all, it's in the repertoire of all those non-linguistic animals. Secondly, um, it's a task that doesn't require um, executive functions um, that aren't well to be known within the repertoire of uh, uh, kids as young as 10 months of age. From all of the work of Lisa Feigenson on, on bucket choice and bucket, bucket reach tasks, we know that babies can create mental models, two mental models, if they're models of reality, um, um, at once, um, in sequence, and then do computations over the contents of those two models, um, uh, up to the limits of three objects in one and two in the other, um, in choosing which is more, um, other computations as well, creating set representations um, over them. Um, so, so this is this is only one object and two two containers that just does not, and they can also inhibit response to the last one that you've manipulated, et cetera. So, so this task does not seem to, to exceed the executive function um, um, capacities of kids this age. Um, and furthermore, we, we also run internal controls for, for performance level um, failures on these tasks. So this seems to be a really fair task to explore. Also, this seems this require this can't be done by by consistency monitoring, one to one match mapping. Um, they have to make an inference either based on a contrary empty, a protological one, or um, fully composed, not in the bucket. Right. So so. If, that, if, if the children are doing at least one of those in Inladi, they should succeed at this task, right? Not, f 40 species of non-human animals can succeed at this task. So, so I showed you how this worked. And, and we also know already, the 
people that had before we did this, Hill and Sudendorf had um, shown that three, four, and five-year-olds succeeded this task, but that, that's no use to us. That those, th these are fully competent you know, users of or and not already um, and of combinatorial language. But uh, Schill, Bodhi, and Roman and I and different experiments had shown that 23-month-olds and 19-month-olds can do it as well. So what we wa are doing in the experiment is try to find the youngest age, especially 12-month-olds. So we started with 17-month-olds and 15-month-olds. And um, um, here's the results. 17-month-olds um, do statistically, there's only four trials. So this is funny, it's spontaneous success, right? Um, and highly significantly, they, the 17-month-olds succeed, and the 15-month-olds are entirely at chance, right? They fail. Um, so they are failing to provide evidence for either protological or logical negation in this task. Um, um, now, it's not that this task makes information, in, working memory demands on the child that they can't um, succeed, but it does it did offer a lot of sources of difficulty that we have to check aren't the ones that are, are causing that problem. So for example, we, we, we drew attention to both containers. So the, the, we, we showed them one is empty and then we, we drew the attention to the other one by manipulating it. So between when they encoded that the ball went behind there, this experimenter shows them one's empty, does this, maybe they just forget of the four, you know, they, they just lose track of what the goal is. Maybe they don't care about the ball. Um, the 15 month olds, I mean, the 15 month olds could fail for all kinds of reasons. So we did an experiment that controlled for those, and, and I'll show, just show you, and, and, and notice the difference here is that she separates her hand before it goes going. Okay, so they can see, they can anticipate where the ball is going, okay? So they don't have to infer where it's going, but then she does all the things that would lead them to forget it, and maybe if they don't care about the ball, they won't get the ball. Where's the dog? Can you find the dog? You found it again. So now 15-month-olds are just as good as the 17-month-olds. So the problem is in the exclusion inference itself. Okay, and we found we, we wanted to look at a second face valid task probing this exclusion inference or the disjunctive syllogism. And we looked at um, causal learning indirect screening off trials. So the indirect screening off trials, so this is the Blicket detector task. The no inference trials is you simply show the child that the green one makes the machine light up and do something interesting and then, and the red one doesn't. And then you ask the child, can you make it go? And um, the exclusion one is you show them that the, that the yellow and blue one or purple one together make it go. Show them that twice. And then you show them that the purple one doesn't and they have to infer that it, it had to be the yellow one. Now this is a more complicated inference because it could have also required that it be both. Um, but um, we exclude trials where the child puts both on because that's perfectly rational, but it doesn't give us information. They don't actually do that very often. They usually do just one, okay? So the question is, can children below um, 15 months um, um, or 17 months succeed at this task? This had been, Sobel and Kirkham had done this task with, um, and they found 24-month-olds could do it and 19-month-olds couldn't, but they'd only given them one screening off trial. So the first thing we did was give them more training in no inference trials and then um, gave them uh, four um, indirect screening off trials. And what we found, um, and we tested 19-month-olds, um, they robustly succeed. I don't have a figure with all three ages on it. Um, um, but um, here are the 15 and 17 month olds. We, we then, we got success, robust success at 19 month olds. And here what you find is that um, both the, the 15 and 17 month olds are succeeding above chance on the no inference trials. They understand the task, they're motivated to, and they can, 
they can inhibit response to the last one you manipulated because you always put the 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 non the non blicket on last. Um, um, but only the seventeen month olds are 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 fragilely um, uh, succeeding. And so the the developmental progression in both of these tasks goes from out and out failure at 15 month old, fragile success at 17, and robust success by 19. Developmental, same developmental function. So, interim summary same developmental function, no evidence of either logical or protological, <laughs> got proctological again, <laughs> um, neg negation before, um, before uh, 15 months. Now, the importance in this polemic is this just, just give you reason to doubt that the Arlotti Sasana task um, um, reflected um, either protological or, or um, uh, fully logical negation. And this raises the question, is why is this changing between 15 and, seven, and seven, 19 months? What's changing? What's coming in? Is, is fully logical negation coming in, or is it protological negation that's coming in? Um, I don't know. Um, but uh, we can make sense of the, the timing if it's fully logical one. It, the timing is after there's evidence for propositional relations in language, right? Um, that, that comes in at 15 months, and this is happening right after that. That would make sense if, is the, if you need those representations for, for even for a non-linguistic symbol to combine with. You could at least make sense of that. It could also be protological negation that's coming in, but then we don't have any particular story about why then, um, and especially since non-linguistic animals succeed at this task. But we have no idea on which basis non-linguistic animals are succeeding. This has not been studied at all. Is it logical disjunctive syllogism in that case? Is it precursor? If it, and I've tried to specify what a precursor could be, but what if, if, if that's not right, what what else could a precursor be? What could be have part of the logical function of negation but not all of it? And if you've specified that, how would you know whether the success is based on one or the other? Or could it be a fully non-logical version? That hasn't been studied. Um, and another thing that hasn't been studied is a developmental story in animals. So all the animals that succeed are adults. We don't know at what age in, in the development of those animals that they could succeed. Because if, if there is a developmental story, it might give a picture for why it, there, might, it, there might be you, studies you could do to, 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 to see whether the developmental here, here is the same thing. OK. Um, so, so I should have given you a spoiler alert at the beginning, which was that I wasn't going to answer the question. The only thing that I've tried to do is to make you doubt that these face valid tasks of the disjunctive syllogism have answered the question of whether pre-linguistic babies or non-linguistic animals have these logical operators. The second half of my talk, which is going to be no, no half at all, um, is that, um, it, but I, ref I, uh, I um, invite you to uh, Brian Leahy's talk on Saturday um, because he's going to he'll give this part of the story. Although he was counting on me setting up uh, parts of it that I'm not going to have time to do. Um, but the argument is this: um, a reason to believe the infant toddler success cannot be the disjunctive syllogism um, is that either need logical or are logical possible, right? So whether there's logical not already by toddlerhood, there is tons of evidence that suggests that neither of these becomes available until after three uh, at the earliest for or, and, or age four at the earliest for logical possible, both from studies of the language of disjunction and possibility and from studies of non-linguistic probes of, of these concepts. So, so the, the research proceeds in this case as well as saying, what would protological versions of these concepts be? What, what, what could the representations be that have some of the logical functions of each of those? 
Um, and what are non-logical non, um, bases on which children could um, succeed these tasks? And I think we've got the goods in this case better than for negation and um, very strong evidence that um, these arise um, in the pre preschool years. Um, so if that's the case, it's very unlikely that the kids are representing it's possibly in the cup and it's possibly behind the screen with actual modal operators. Or it could, be, it, it, it's in the cup or, um, uh, it's the snake in the cup or the, uh, the ball, right? So if it's really true that those concepts as re re reflected by both non-linguistic tasks and the adult representations of the language are coming online roughly together much later, um, um, that is also a reason to, to doubt that the, the infant um, results could be showing what, what, what they were interpreted to, sh to be showing when you claim they show evidence for working through a disjunctive syllogism. Okay, so this, is, this was the... Uh, <laughs> um, so I just want to get to my conclusion. It's too bad. Um, um, <laughs> Tons more work needed. Um, okay, so I, what I've tried to illustrate here is what kinds, kind of work this work will be. Um, we need to take the lessons from the number literature and the theory of mind literature. Um, and that is we need precise characterizations of the target, I'm not claiming I gave these, of the target representations and computations we are seeking to explain. And of partial, i.e. proto or precursor, um, that might be part of the learning story. Um, um, and in order to characterize the role of language um, in that learning, um, we have to find out when kids master the, the language um, in, in, in either protological or logical ways. Um, um, and that requires just much better descriptions of both what the actual representations and computations underlying this performance, these performances could be, so we can test between um, uh, alternative hypotheses. Um, and this is like, you know, theory of mind is 30 years old, the number of literature is 20 years old, we really know how to do that, we're really making progress, as we could see from, from the talks this morning and, um, or this afternoon, and Hanish's talk, uh, yesterday in the theory of mind case, and I, many of you know the number case. It's very satisfying, um, but we're not there here. So I hope that maybe some other people will join us in this project. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Um, the floor is open for questions. Nico? Hi, okay. Th thank you so much for the, it was a great talk, and thank you so much for, um, you know, dedicating so much time discussing my study. This is yeah, great. This is really <laughs> it's not even a criticism of your study. Your study is a beautiful study, and it yeah. just raises the question of what the underlying representations are really like. And I, I, I really appreciate the fact you, that you, I think your discussion was extremely clear and it touched a, a lot of very critical questions that are related to the general <coughs> kind of questions we are interested in and the interpretation of the study. Um, I have to say that there are certain points uh, to which I think I, I, I have to agree with you that there are like, for example, I don't know if we are in the position uh, now, I mean, uh, with the work that I've done with Luca and uh, to distinguish like between uh, um, um, explicit logical representation that might involve like uh, <coughs> some kind of logical operators with syntactical and combinatorial ability, like probably like the kind of representation the father had in mind when, 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 when we characterize the, 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 the language of thought from protological operations that I, I take to be like representation that uh, they are not like explicit symbols dedicated for the kind of logical abstract relation, but somehow in a more implicit way, without a dedicated representation, can capture um, okay. so that kind of you uh, never told logical us relations. That that's what you meant by by, by protological, but but here, but, but can I just respond already? 
I don't know what implicit and explicit means in that context. I don't mean by explicit that it's lexicalized in a natural language. Um, um, what, so here, here is what, so, so this partly, I hate the use of the terms explicit and implicit in the theory of mind literature because sometimes it refers to tasks. Well, a looking time task is not, doesn't wear on its sleeves, it's an implicit, a, a looking time measure isn't particularly implicit where a reaching me measure is particular, what, what, right? So, so implicit and explicit doesn't apply to tasks. It could apply to representations, but what would it be? Well, here's what I think it means, and then I want you to tell me what you think it means. Um, um, because, because when you see what I think it means, it, it, it's not gonna, this is how I'm using it. Um, content can be carried either by, look, if you adapt a representational computational theory of mind, you're committed to there being mental symbols, whether they're sub, modular or the outputs of modules, that's what it means. And, um, and we take that literally, right? It's not a metaphor. We have to be able to ask, what are those symbols like? What's their format? What computational role does that format support? So think of analog magnitude representations of number. Those are actual symbols, states of the nervous system that are analog, um, um, Anal an analogs to numerical quantity or other quantities, because there's analog ma magnitude representations of all, the symbols are explicit there in the sense that there is actually a symbol that represents approximately or exactly um, with noise around it, um, the cardinal value of a set. So in those symbols are explicit, right, in the sense that there's an actual symbol with that content. But take the content in um, in, in working memory models that captures numerical content. That's all in the, in the computations they enter to. The computations that compute numerical identity. Um, now, it's computing something that's deeply numerical, whether it's the same one or a different one, um, but there's no symbol for one there. And if you take the, the, the numerical content that allows the child to program the number of reaches, um, that's given, the, the explicit symbols are symbols for the object files, and the numerical content is given in whatever procedure that allows you to reach the number of times. So what I mean by implicit is that there isn't any symbol any place, sub, sub, you know, it doesn't mean language symbol, right? It means, so, so what I'm asking for, is there evidence for a symbol for not, right? Whether it's internal to the module or not, or is the, the content carried that for for not have you know uh, some, some done done in some co the computations in some way, okay. So so I'm not looking for, what I'm not looking for is logical in the sense that we can formalize it, right? I'm I'm asking, are there symbols that that are the output of some process that can be held in working memory for composed thoughts like not a ball? Yeah. I, I think this, this, in this case, this question in, in the case of the study of like logical representation or of the language of thought, I think it, it's a crucial question and I agree with you because like uh, a logical representation have a lot of, uh, there are function words uh, in language. If you look at language or logical model, they have also syntactic uh, properties that I think, uh, um, <coughs> I mean, is they, they, they can make sense when you think in terms of having like a dedicated mental symbol. So mm -hmm. I agree that this is a very important point. And, um, and, uh, uh, and the, the question that we were after and is whether, and, and these are symbols for logical representation in the sense that you have a mental symbol that stands for, or like that, <coughs> for, a, for, a, for an abstract relation, like a relation of this junction. At least one of these two alternatives, these two possibilities has to be correct. And um, in this, and I think, um, I would say that, I don't know if Luke agree, agrees with me, but we might not evidence we, for we, we, we might not uh, um, evidence uh, that can decide between the alternative between having a, an explicit symbol for this junction rather than having more more explicit representation of a disjunctive relation, and but 
there is something that, you know, like, is also, has been, like, proposed. For example, you might have, you can imagine computation over a space of alternatives that in an implicit way realize a, rela a relation of this junction such that when you have evidence that exclude or rule out one of these uh, alternative model or hypothesis, <coughs> the other one... Uh, yeah, so the, the I think we shouldn't have the left. whole discussion uh, uh, period be a debate. Yeah, so okay, what's the question? My, 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 <laughs> yeah. my, my, my question is the following. Uh, you, you characterize uh, your, an alternative proposal that you, um, <coughs> um, there was like related with the uh, object tracking system, yeah. and you were very clear and very specific in proposing. And I'm wondering whether somehow <coughs> in that proposal that you were giving, there was like actually a, a proposal for a, pro a proto disjunctions. Yeah. Because, so the, 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 and now is my question oh, more good. specifically. Yeah. You, you <laughs> use, good. Use so that was the second half of my talk. No, but okay, so let me answer. Yeah. Can I add an element and then I finish? So you talk about, you say that at some point, the infant is understanding that some object is inside one cup and some object is behind the occluder. But at the same, and after that, they apply to a one-to-one -one mapping. When they see evidence that the screw, that, 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 that fixes the snake which one is, is one. inside the board, they map the other one. Mm -hmm. And if you take the word some in a literal sense, if some object is inside the cup, it doesn't follow that if you find that the snake is outside the cup. I didn't, say, I didn't say it that way. So what, what I said that there might be a sum, yeah. but there should be some kind of relation between the identity of the object inside the cup and the identity okay. of the object seen before. Yeah, sorry. So, so I have to specify what proto-disjunction would be. And again, I mean, I think that proto-negation, as I've described it, is within the capacity of um, any animal that can do a goal-directed search where he, the animal is actually considering matches to the represented goal, right, as opposed to a random walk and just doing it until they find a match. And that's probably mo mo most search processes. Uh, so I think that protological negation is very likely to be, um, in, in that sense of protological negation, based on contraries or just ma mismatched computations, is available to non-linguistic creatures. And then the question is, why isn't it available to 12-month-olds? 12, 12 um, because we've looked for it, and, and, and maybe we could find it. But we didn't find it in the, the call cup task, which is supposed to be an easy version of that, as well as our others. What would proto-disjunction uh, be? There has to be a process of selecting. That's one thing disjunction does for you. Um, so so um, you can't have any kind of search without selecting, you know, choosing a search space. We, any, any animal that, that has working memory um, has um, the, needs the capacities to select what gets put in working memory. But select, even select two, isn't disjunction um, because it doesn't include any commitment to one or, or the other or both of them being true. You've just selected two things of actuality. Um, um, another, th another protological choice of uh, uh, use of disjunction, certainly the one that underlies the, the, the meaning of the words probably early the de in development, is um, choose. So anybody who has a two-year-old knows that you never say, do you want peas, because they will say no. But if you say, do you want peas or carrots, for almost a year you, you, you trick them into saying carrots or peas, right? So they certainly know that when I, you say, if you want A or B, you're supposed to choose one. Well, okay, that's proto-disjunction, but, but you could do that without actually sending, you know, it's, it's just select and choose, right? So, so yes, there has to be at least proto-disjunction proto in that, but not full-blown logical negotiation, and not full-blown logical possibility. Now, I'm not saying that, that that's right. It, you may be completely right that the, that, the, that the right interpretation of this behavior involves, um, you know, completely non-linguistic um, actual symbols for those operators um, that are combining according to the disjunctive syllogism. But then you should be able to find evidence for those symbols in these other tasks. And, 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 and when I went into this, I thought it would be easy to find them, right? Um, which is why I took your, your, your results so seriously because we had just failed to try, you know, I went through, 
there's many more experiments where we've tried, failed, tried, failed, tried, failed, with lots of controls for the executive function demands and that the child's understanding the task is engaged in the task. Um, and so, so I, I wanted to, see, you know, I certainly expected the same result you expect, right? Um, but that's not, I don't think that's what we've got yet. I see many questions. Please uh, try to raise your hands or in the back, please stand up because I don't see very well. So I have seen first Luca, then Judy, then Justin. More questions in the back just to assess how many. And I see a couple of questions there. OK. So, pl so please make it uh, short yeah. so everyone can ask yeah. a question. I, thank I, you. I, I, I thank you very much for the great talk. I promise to make it will be shorter than Nico. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I wonder if you can, uh, I have three, two pieces of data and uh, one uh, question. And the, my question is, if, and I'll explain you this data and you tell me with, if this will move in any way your position towards one what sense I, or the what other. What I'm so arguing today, which I could argue yeah. the opposite tomorrow. So <laughs> convince yeah, it's me very that fine. I should. I right. understand. <laughs> so the first point is something that Nico said is we were not really after negation in that, uh, uh, in that uh, paper. We were after disjunction. The, re the reason is that oh. I really think that negation is the most difficult case. Yeah, so but I, I understand that you have the same line for good reasons on disjunction. I think well. the evidence is better in that case. I, pro I could have just done the latter. I, I, anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, the three points, uh, the three facts uh, that I wanted to know your opinion about are the following. Number one is in the uh, science paper, we were really not even targeting this junction, but we were targeting inferences on the basis of this junction. So as you said correctly. You're, you're targeting what? Inferences pot potentially made on the basis of this junction. Yeah, but, but we don't know presumably the reason you're in, you wouldn't call it the disjunctive syllogism if you didn't think the inferences no, no, were that's based fine, on that's fine. But what so I'm you saying are targeting disjunction. Technically speaking, uh, if, uh, if the object is in the cup and you don't know which object it is, you can imagine unknown X or A or B. We never test this. We test what happens when the other object comes out. No? Mm -hmm. So the first point of data is we now know, we did with uh, Anna Martin uh, and other collaborators, uh, we actually monitored what happens when the object, unknown object versus the known object that you don't see is uh, coming out before the inference. Right? So before the inference, there is a cup that uh, has an object inside. In the non-inference condition, you know which object is inside. In the inference condition, you don't know. So you monitor it is either A or B or an unknown X. And uh, that's the first point of data. We now know, I think quite convincingly, that uh, in this particular moment, so even before the inference, uh, in there is a pupil uh, dilation reflex at the unknown object inside the cup. Now, I don't know if you can interpret this as a disjunction or if an uh, uh, unknown X. That's the first point of data, and you should tell me if you think that this uh, changes in any case uh, uh, the picture. Yeah. The second point of data has to do with the following thing. I agree with you, it's extremely difficult to, to, to even tell apart the, the stories. Right? Now, so what we try to do. There is a poster that is being presented uh, on Saturday on that, which you saw the preliminary results before. We try to say, okay, I, mean, I, don't like, I don't like brain stories because I know nothing about them, but this could be one case in which uh, uh, some brain imaging results can give uh, 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 information. And what we have now is in 12 months old infants and in adults, the, the brain imaging results connected to these uh, uh, points. And what we find in adults is that if you give a, our task completely non-linguistic, the overlapping with the, with the linguistic kind of task in which you are asking explicitly a disjunctive reasoning is, complete, is incredible, but these are adults. In infants, we do find that there is a difference in the circuitry which is, uh, uh, which is uh, activated with respect to adults, Namely, it's bilateral as opposed to being uh, left lateral organized, but it's still very uh, frontal, which suggests some sort of thinking process that is very difficult to put together with some object tracking data. Yeah? And then the third question. Well, what happens in object tracking and object individuation experiments? Are there different areas that are involved? Mm -hmm. I bet there's not. I, it's I working memory, right? And th that's frontal. These are not front working memory areas. Per se, I mean, so well, that's the but question. But, so. you, but you should do that if you're going to make the argument. That yeah, so yeah. I agree that I agree that those those data would be highly relevant, and and I, I think that that's a really good line to pursue. But you need look. Ask yourself, 
I, I, I can make your arguments. You try to make mine, all right? So how would we explain the fact that the, the, even before the inference, the, the children are looking more at, the, at what's in the cup in the, inference in, the, in, the case, in the inference condition than the no inference condition? Well, even on the perceptual consistency monitoring case, right, in the case where they've seen the cup pick the ball up and then carry it over there, um, they know perfectly well what's in that cup. Suppose that all they're doing is monitoring, is what I'm seeing consistent with my initial model? I'm not saying that they're representing that it's, some, it's, it's something in, the, you know, some, some of those, uh, some, what do you mean by some object? It, I don't think they're representing it's the ball or it's the snake. It's just that there are two objects and they were both behind the screen. And now I've got evidence that one of them is in the cup. Is that consistent? Even if you're not worrying about whether it's the ball or cup, is that consistent with my model? And that requires more processing than if they saw you pick, they have the full model there in full view. What I'm claiming is that on all these object file experiments, that's what you start with, a fully specified model of what's in the scene. And then you put things behind concluders and they either go behind, you know, through barriers or not through barriers. And what you're trying to, to um, do, you might not be making a prediction, but you're, monitor, you, you're, you're updating your memory with what you've seen there and that's gonna take processing. Speed. Okay. So, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we have to give the uh, floor also to other questions. Uh, there were two questions here. Oh. Okay. Hi, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see that you found the cup, the core cup paradigm to be a face valid case of negation. The four but cup, I didn't mention the four cup at all. No, the, the, the call cup task. So you show the empty cup, and if you avoid that empty cup and go for the full cup, then this is protological, if I followed the argument. Well, if it, if it, were, doing just, if it were just being done on avoid the empty cup, I, would, I wouldn't set, call it protological. So I think it's an lies the question. Exclusion. So you had this lovely case with the match and the non-match, that if you just show the match, they succeed. If you show the non-match, the two cards that show a non-match, and you could infer that, they didn't succeed. So but do you have not, a comparable condition? But that isn't condition? the call cup task. So the no, no, but, so the, but I'm, so I, I'm, not on, on, yeah. I'm trying to yeah. ask my question quickly. Um, yeah. So I should really probably use a few more words. Um, <laughs> so I guess I'm wondering, is there a condition analogous to that which you have in the match to sample, non-match to sample, for the call cup task to show that it's not just avoiding a particular analog stimulus, in this case, an empty bucket, yes, which they've yes. got enough experience in their life, both the animals and pre -max the 17 version of The pre-max version of this task, um, which preceded calls by quite a while, um, was designed to rule out that low-level um, interpretation. You know, the, you, this, the animals could certainly learn to just avoid an empty cup. Right. Yes, but, but it, when but, they do mm, it spontaneously, yeah. they aren't learning to avoid. Uh, uh, but w what he showed, well, the way he did it, was there were um, two objects, two different kinds of food hidden, um, and um, the animal knew that one item of food went into one of the cups and the other item of food went into the other cup. So you have to at least have an object file representation of um, the two foods and where they are, which we know that, that seven month old babies can do under some circumstances and certainly by 10 month olds they can do and animals can do that. And then the inference was this, the experimenter removed one of the foods um, from those cups, uh, from those cups, but the, the, ch the, the animal couldn't see which, which, which they, they removed it from and ate it in front of, and, and then the animal was given the cups. So th they've never shown anything empty, so they're not just avoiding empty as aversive. Now you could say they've inferred it was empty because, because you took the thing out of it, 
Um, but then, still, you're now making an inference based on an inferred emptiness that it's going to be in the other one, right? So, so that's the attempt to rule out very, at least a low-level associative version of that model. At least they're, mo they're, they're, do they're doing this on working memory models of, of uh, ob object files. So what I I, I'm not claiming that, it's, that it's a face, it was taken as a face-valid um, uh, measure of, of disjunctive syllogism. That requires that it be done over the lot. That, I mean, that requires that it, it involves the logical operators. Uh, um, I didn't say it was that. It was taken to be that. But I was saying it does involve a genuine exclusion inference. Right? It can't be done by a one-to-one -one mapping model like, like this. Um, so um, um, so it, you, you have to make an inference from its being empty. Empty can be a contrary, right? Um, but, um, but it's not just empty as aversive, right, um, from the pre-max -pre stuff, right? Um, but then you would want to do that condition with the 17-month-olds, presumably. Um, yeah, that's a good, a, 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 a good point. But 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 the polemic is there. The polemic is at the age of, of the twelve month olds, um, e the babies aren't doing any e either of those, right? So we don't have to. We don't. Uh, yes, yeah, I'm, that's I'm right. with you on that. And and, yeah. it, it, and and furthermore, that doesn't apply to the Blicket detector. And we're getting the same. There we could talk about overshadowing, but I will not dare. Yes, we yeah. are uh, eight minutes behind schedule. The reception started, but we can take two very short questions in case they are very, very short. Uh, we didn't take any questions from the back. Is there, uh, or there was another question? Or oh, there were actually, can you? So, any question from the back? Please stand up. I don't see well. No, then they were. Yuri and Justin, um, neither of you can ask short questions, so <laughs> what do we do? You can. Okay. I hold the microphone. <laughs> I have less time. Uh, uh, my one is short. I actually uh, very much like the approach uh, that you take, and, and I just want to mention. Uh, uh, one suggestion, one, one point to make uh, the, uh, the Moody task the, uh, 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 so that children pass it, but in the protological way that you suggest. And that would be, and I don't misunderstand me, just, you know, just by like going out and kick, kick the bucket. So <laughs> <laughs> basically, uh, uh, by chance, and that would reveal the bucket to be open, and you know you could just put it back, and that's it. I mean, you wouldn't have to do anything to the other one. And I predict that they would go and and go for the board uh, in the other one. Yeah. So you think that that they're just one more sentence. But but it but that's what our control. Ta you're saying the fact that we do this elaborate showing them, uh, even though we, we also do it with the other one, we show them the other one as well. Um, so we, sh we, we elaborately show both of them because we're worried about that. And that was also the reason why we did the control like this. Because we're again, after we've done all this, we elaborately show them. So if there's something in the pra communicative practice of elaborately showing them, that's true yeah. in the control condition as well, and they yeah. succeed at it perfectly well. So uh, here is my more general point, and then. Ostensibly demonstrated events. Take the A not B error. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in the A not B error, remove the uh, communication 10 months, at 10 months, and then not pers do perseveration, and uh, uh, apes, I agree. That's a, that Aves don't do perseveration yeah. now. So that I mean, that's a we rule out perseveration as 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 a, a, as a source of the problem in this case. Is there is it, there, there is some perseveration, but at both ages, and you take it out, and the, the difference it gets starker, uh, right? So the fifteen month olds are just completely still at chance, and of course, when you've ruled out the perseverators at the seventeen month olds, you have virtually ceiling success. Um, so. <coughs> um, 
I, th I mean, I think that's an interesting su suggestion, and it would be very interesting to me. But I, I don't think it will work, because it's common between the control task and the experimental one. The, all the extensive stuff is the same between them. But the 15-month-olds succeed in the control, but not the, the control where you've, you've, you've done it at the top, where you don't have an exclusion inference. So I, d I doubt, I mean, it, 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 I, I would be very, very interested if this were the case, but I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, and that's why, we, that's why one of the reasons we did that control. Thank you. So the very, very short um, two-word question. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Thank you very much.